Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work with the fictional character Travis Bickle from the 1976 movie Taxi Driver. So I'll issue a spoiler alert for Taxi Driver. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So I'll start here with a summary of the movie, and then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. So moving to the summary. Travis Bickle is a 26-year-old former United States Marine who lives in New York City. He served in the Vietnam War and was honorably discharged in May of 1973. He describes his educational level as some here and there. So I take that to mean a fairly low educational level. Bickle takes a job driving a taxi cab overnight because he believes it'll help him cope with his insomnia. He works quite a bit, sometimes for 12 hours at a time. He works six to seven days a week. He has a number of mental health problems in addition to the insomnia, including depression, anger management problems, social awkwardness, and paranoia. He seems to be looking for a sense of purpose in his life. He wants to be something greater than he is. As he drives around New York City at night, he writes these little phrases down in a diary that he keeps, like positive, concise thoughts. Also, when he's driving his cab, he runs into a number of individuals who have difficulty obeying the law. People committing theft, people involved in prostitution, people struggling with substance use, and he starts to fantasize about eradicating these populations. Bickle notices a woman named Betsy, played by Sybil Shepard, at a campaign office for a presidential candidate named Charles Palantine. He watches her from his cab for a while before going into the campaign office and pretending to offer support to the candidate. He asks her if she'll have coffee with him. She does, and then he asks her to go out on a date. She consents, but he takes her to a theater that plays less than wholesome material, and she becomes upset and refuses to go out with him again. With his mental health symptoms aggravated, he buys a number of firearms from a guy named Easy Andy. Specifically, he buys four pistols, a Smith & Wesson Model 29. This is a 44 caliber six-shot revolver, the same one carried by Clint Eastwood in several of the Dirty Harry movies. He buys a Smith & Wesson Model 36. This is a 38 caliber five-shot. It's interesting because Robert De Niro used the same gun in the 2019 movie, The Irishman. He buys a Smith & Wesson Model 61 Escort. This is a 22 caliber semi-automatic, not a Colt 25 caliber as was indicated in the movie. This weapon would be carried by Robert De Niro in the 1990 film Goodfellas. And we see he purchases an Astra Constable. This is a 380 ACP, automatic Colt pistol, not a Walther PPK, as was indicated in the film. The same model was also featured in Goodfellas, but it was carried by Ray Liotta's character. There were some continuity errors in the film where they showed guns later as if they were the same firearms. For example, they did show a Walther PPK in the film when they meant to show the Astra Constable. Now we see that Bickle tries to get in shape through these intense workouts. He holds his arm over a flame, I guess to test his resistance to pain, and he tries to look intimidating as he practices drawing weapons in the mirror. On one occasion, Bickle goes into a store and a man tries to rob it. He shoots the robber, incapacitating and maybe killing him. It's not clear, although it does seem like he's dead. He tells the owner of the store that he doesn't have a permit for the firearm, and the owner tells Bickle that he'll take care of it, and he takes the weapon from Bickle. Then the owner proceeds to beat the robber with a pipe. After this incident, which would have disturbed almost anybody, we see that Bickle goes right back to his routine like nothing happened. Right, so we see the low neuroticism at play here. After this, he shaves his head, giving himself a mohawk, and he goes to one of Charles Palantine's speeches, but the Secret Service notices him as he's pulling out a weapon, and he runs away. It appears as though he was going to kill Palantine. He had done some scouting before in the movie around Charles Palantine's speeches. After this, he becomes preoccupied with a 12-year-old girl named Iris, played by Jodie Foster, who is being exploited by a pimp named Sport, played by Harvey Keitel. Bickle pays for her time, but does not do anything but talk. He tries to get her to leave Sport and go back to her parents. 
Iris won't cooperate with Bickle, so he starts to think of ways to protect her by force. Bickle returns to the building where Iris works, shoots Sport in the stomach with the 38, then enters the building and shoots one of the bouncers with the 44 Magnum, blowing off four of the bouncer's fingers. Sport, even though he's wounded, manages to point his own 38 caliber revolver at Bickle from behind and shoot him in the neck. He's using a Smith & Wesson Model 10. That's the same firearm used by that robber. Bickle shoots Sport with the 44 Magnum, drops that weapon, switches back to the 38, and shoots the bouncer in the body. Bickle is ascending the stairs. When the bouncer comes up and confronts him, Bickle points the 38 at him, but does not fire. Now, as this is going on, Iris's customer, a mobster, is overhearing this commotion, and he comes out of Iris's room and fires a shot into Bickle's upper right arm at point-blank range with a 38. This was also a Smith & Wesson Model 36, but it was blued instead of nickel-plated. This causes Bickle to drop his 38. Bickle then deploys this slide-mounted 22 caliber automatic, so he had put this on a drawer slide so he could fit it up his sleeve. He fires this several times at the mobster, killing him. The bodyguard is still yelling at him and grabbing at him. Bickle stabs him with a knife that he had taped to his boot, then uses the mobster's 38 caliber to kill the bouncer with a single shot to the head. He takes that same revolver and tries to end his own life, but it is out of ammunition, as is his 22 caliber automatic, even though if it was really out of ammunition, the slide would have locked back, and in the movie, the slide is still forward. He sits down on Iris's couch. The police enter and point a weapon at him. It's another Smith & Wesson Model 10. Bickle points his finger, like in the shape of a gun, at his head and makes it look like he's firing as he smiles at the officers. After this, we see that Bickle is not charged and is actually considered a hero. When he's in the hospital, he gets a letter from Iris's parents. They have her back, and they're quite happy about that. He sees Betsy again when she gets into his cab. She's now willing to talk to him, and she mentions that she read about him in the newspaper. Bickle drops her off without charging her for the ride. Now, the people involved in the production and direction of this film have said that this ending was supposed to be real, not something from Bickle's imagination. Although, of course, it seems highly unrealistic. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. Let's take a look at Travis Bickle's personality profile using the five-factor model. I remember the five factors through the acronym OCEAN. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. With openness to experience, we see that Bickle's level is low. He's really not that intellectually curious, not particularly creative, although he did use that drawer slide to hide that weapon. Based on his selection of movies, he doesn't appear to have an appreciation of art. It really seems to be just the opposite. He doesn't seem to understand how people might be offended by those films under certain circumstances. As far as conscientiousness, he does seem to be a productive worker, but he's also impulsive and reckless. He was almost arrested at that campaign headquarters after confronting Betsy, and of course he committed a triple homicide, even though he wasn't prosecuted. As far as extroversion, his level is low. He's not outgoing or talkative. He isn't particularly friendly, and he has few positive emotions. Although he is somewhat assertive at times, like when he's committing murder, he's sensation-seeking, and he maintains a high level of activity. Now, even though we see a split with the facets, like some high and some low, overall I think his level would still be low. With agreeableness, his level is low. He is not trusting, modest, empathic, or altruistic. On the other hand, he is straightforward, almost to a fault, but his overall score would be low, as I indicated. Now, with neuroticism, his level is mid-range. He has difficulty resisting temptation, some anger management issues, and he's depressed, but he really doesn't seem anxious. He was able to engage in violent activities, like the shootout at the end of the movie, and remain amazingly calm. As far as mental disorders, I think that in this film, they're trying to portray him as having post-traumatic stress disorder. It would explain the insomnia, the negative mood, and being hypervigilant. He could also have depression, but it's not really clear. In addition to PTSD and or depression, his behavior aligns with personality pathology. Bickle is highly judgmental. He is disgusted by others who he considers to be filth, like when he has to clean out the back seat of his cab and he complains about all the fluids that are deposited there. He thinks of himself as one of the only people who is actually pure and good, 
When the guy at the taxi company is asking him about his driving record, he responds by saying, it's clean, real clean, like my conscious. Among his friends, the other cab drivers, he's not connected in the conversation. It's like he's distracted and he doesn't realize how he appears to them. So there's a lack of insight, also referred to as anosognosia. When he's having coffee with Betsy, he confronts her right away. He says, I think you're a lonely person, not a happy person. I think you need something. Then he starts to disparage her coworker. You have no connection with the guy. He doesn't respect you. After this, he pivots to asking her to go see a movie with him. When she noticed that it was a less than polite movie, he said a lot of couples see this movie. So again, just a disconnect. He didn't understand what people's preferences really were. He wasn't good at empathizing. During his encounter with Palantine when Palantine was riding in Bickle's cab, Bickle doesn't really seem to realize how disturbing his narrative was. Like he was talking and Palantine was being understanding, but Bickle was taking things too far and didn't really connect with that. Palantine was still kind to him even though he was clearly a little concerned with Bickle's narrative. After being rejected by Betsy, he confronts her at work, saying that she's going to hell. He believes that she's just like the others, cold and distant. Now that statement, just like the others, I think is important because it taps into the idea that he thought the wider population was evil. So it kind of points back to that paranoia. Bickle has odd mannerisms, beliefs, and thinking, like when he said, I got some bad ideas in my head, and he's focused on violence and negative aspects in life in general. There's a theme where he seems to believe that he's going to be the victim, or he already is the victim, again, of these evil people. So there's some conspiratorial thinking going on, almost like he's so worried about it that he's trying to promote a confrontation that he thinks people want to have with him, like he's going to beat them to the punch, as indicated by the line, you talking to me, one of the most famous lines in movie history. Bickle is deterministic, as indicated by the line, now I see it clearly, my whole life is pointed in one direction, I see that now, there has never been any choice for me. So really he's being irresponsible, he's making it seem like his life is predetermined, and that absolves him of any wrongdoing. Bickle is profoundly lonely, like when he says, loneliness has followed me my whole life, everywhere. He doesn't like that other people try to attract attention to themselves. For example, he said, a person shouldn't dedicate his life to morbid self-attention. I believe that someone should become a person like other people. So taking this all together, we see a variety of personality pathology that is evident with Bickle. Symptoms of narcissism, like a sense of entitlement and a lack of empathy. Symptoms of paranoia, the odd thinking and mannerisms. The fact that he chooses solitary activities. He's emotionally cold detached and has flat affect. He has limited social skills. He is inflexible about areas of morality, and he's stubborn. His behavior doesn't line up with any single personality disorder. Rather, he has features from a number, including paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal, antisocial, narcissistic, and obsessive compulsive. The obsessive compulsive is seen when he's being strict about areas of morality. From a developmental perspective, Bickle was trying to fit in. He's trying to play by the rules. He approaches Betsy thinking they can have a romantic relationship. He works long hours driving the cab, trying to make a lot of money. But at some point, it's not working and he gives up. He can't find meaning in his life through ordinary living. So he starts plotting paths to greatness or fulfillment. He plans on killing Palantine and rescuing Iris, even though, of course, it would be difficult to actually do both he would be happy just to be able to complete one. Ultimately, he achieves the latter and somehow is permitted to remain free and have that victory, which of course, as I mentioned, is not realistic given the circumstances. And I think this really detracted from the film. Even though those three men were committing felonies, Bickle would have been convicted for committing homicide. Now, kind of stepping back and looking at all this, as I mentioned, Bickle doesn't fit into one category. I think the closest category, however, would be antisocial. He probably had depression and other specified personality disorder, mixed personality features. This movie featured an interesting character in Travis Bickle, but not one that was realistic. It reminds me of another movie inspired by Taxi Driver, Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. Just as was the case with that movie, I really didn't enjoy Taxi Driver. 
I watched it many years ago, probably in the early 90s, and then again a few days ago to prepare for this video. I didn't like it either time. I thought maybe when I watched it more recently, I would have found it more appealing, but that didn't happen. There were aspects of the movie that I did like. The setting, New York City, and the cinematography was pretty good. It was the mental health part that I felt didn't work. I believe that was a key component for a movie like this. So if they can't get that dialed in, the movie is going to misfire. Which I think is a fitting way to put it, considering they really couldn't seem to get anything right with the firearms either, right? So we see quite a few weaknesses in this film. But as I mentioned again, an interesting character that did have a development over the course of the movie that was somewhat compelling. Those are my thoughts on Travis Bickle from Taxi Driver. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.